Hello, everyone, <laughs> and welcome to Tomorrow Space Orbit 12.05. We're very excited for you to be here today because we have a very cool guest with Joe Bernard from <laughs> BPS Space showing you some of the wild things that he is doing in the world of amateur rocketry. So once again, this is Tomorrow Orbit 12.05. Good morning. How's everything up in the sky? And I am Jared Head, the host for today. You probably know me as the resident astronomer of tomorrow. And right next to me, I've got Sarah Vincent, who, what, what are we calling you uh, today? Insert nickname here. You pick. Okay, Let's yeah. Let's see, you, what, what do I do? What am I? Yes. We can what bring it up to a community yeah, vote. We can I'm, do I'm, that. I'm up for that. And we uh, do most everything with community Sarah votes. Sarah McSarah face would be hilarious. Okay. I'm just putting that out there. Sounds right? good. Yeah. Sounds like a good new Twitter yeah, handle yeah. Uh, if you need it. <laughs> yes. And then we have Athena. Hello. Uh, Athena, how the heck do you say your last name? Brensberger. Brensberger. So Athena Brensberger, and yes. you are like our resident <laughs> super, <laughs> like, super stellar explosion. explosion expert here. Yes. So. Yes. Excellent stuff. And I then <laughs> all the way on the end, uh, as we mentioned in our intro, we have Joe Bernard from BPS Space today. Uh, and we're very excited to have you on the show here. I know I'm excited because I'm an amateur rocketeer um, <laughs> myself, and some of us here are amateur rocketeers. Uh, so uh, I guess just to kind of uh, start out a little bit, uh, just kind of give us a little bit of background about yourself um, and maybe how you kind of got involved in rocketry. Yeah. So my name is Joe Barnard, like you said. Um, I run this company called BPS.Space, or BPS Space. I don't really know like what to call it. That's the website, though, and also <laughs> the name. Anyway, we build um, these really advanced model rocketry components. Um, and I kind of just cut, like, I want to see how crazy advanced you can make these small scale rockets. A lot of times when rocketeers want to build like bigger things, you're an amateur rocketeer. Yes, so, like, <laughs> bigger is better. Well, yeah, so that's like the you know. common, that's like the common, um, view that like a lot of people take and actually in a lot of ways bigger is better but um, you can also get really advanced at the model scale if you start incorporating like guidance systems and things like that into your low power rockets you can stay really safe and still learn a ton about how the real things get to orbit or get to wherever um, so that's kind of what we do um, i'm all self-taught in it so it's like kind of also a journey of like how much can I not mess up on like my path through <laughs> learning this? Um, but yeah, that's that's about it. I studied I studied music, and then I saw what SpaceX was doing in 2015, um, and it was like, uh oh, I picked the wrong career. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so then I, I picked up a bunch of textbooks and I just like got to work. So cool. you literally just like dive in the textbooks, and that's how you learn yeah. physics behind all of this. Um, it's also so cool. crazy. Like it sounds like a joke, but for real, there are a lot of YouTube tutorials that like work pretty well for. Oh yes. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, um, so with this, did you also have to learn how to kind of like work with the hardware that came with it as mm -hmm. well? Yep. So I'm not a mechanical engineer. I mean, at this point, maybe, but like, I wasn't. <laughs> um, and so I bought a 3D printer. I got like some CAD software. It's like you know, computer aided design. Um, and again, like YouTube tutorials get you started pretty well, and then you just sort of try things, especially with like a 3D printer. Um, you can iterate so many times, like you know, print seven versions of the same part in the same day um, and basically just like make it a little better each time. So yeah. it's it's really forgiving if you're not a good engineer to start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 3D printing, you know, rapid prototyping. Yeah. That's like you could do <laughs> tweaks on the fly if you need to. Yeah, and we <laughs> see this in like all of the real aerospace companies too. Mm -hmm. They're moving all of their stuff to um, Inconel or whatever it is that they're 3D printing um, for some of the more complex parts or just to do rapid iteration on their designs. So when you got into rocketry, were you really like looking to push the, the boundaries of what amateur rocketry could do? Or did, or did you just, <laughs> did you just like one day go like, hmm, you know what? You know, kind of like yeah. that kind of a moment. No, definitely, definitely not. Um, the, <laughs> the way that it started is, so I, I mentioned I saw this, I saw this video. It was specifically the F9 Dev R test. Um, one of the ones in McGregor goes up to like, you know, a thousand meters, comes back down. Um, and I saw a video of this on Facebook. I was like, uh-oh, 
That, yeah, that's the, uh-oh, I picked the wrong career moment. And I kind of figured, like, I wanted a job with these people, and um, I, I knew that, like, I couldn't show up with a music degree and ask for a job. Like, I wouldn't be taken seriously, and rightfully so. Um, so I had to demonstrate it in some other way, or I had to go back to engineering school. And that second option is really expensive, takes a long time. And it was a literal shower idea where I thought, maybe, like... <laughs> I knew that Arduino existed, that all of this like open source coding existed. I knew that you could get into 3D printing and like print a bunch of parts. There were lots of different rocket engines and rocket parts available. And I figured if I worked hard enough, I could probably like try to launch and land a Falcon 9 replica. And that would be enough where I could like tweet it. I didn't really think of the logistics here, but like I, I could like tweet it to SpaceX or something mm -hmm. and uh, see if they would say, hey, do you want an interview? Um, so that's how it got started. Um, it's mostly I just I just wanted a job in the aerospace industry, um, and it's something much different now. It's I I just like along the way I've realized I just find this stuff so fulfilling, and um, I love sharing what I've learned online, even when it doesn't work. Like um, you end up getting a lot of good feedback and becoming a better engineer from it. But that's what mm -hmm. I do. Yeah. yeah, that's so cool. Yeah. We actually yeah. have a question from the chat. Um, it's from Gregorius Sodaharmo from uh, YouTube. And they ask, what is the limit on guidance before it became illegal? Man, that's a, that's <laughs> yeah. a good question. That's actually yeah. my question, too. Yeah. I was going to say, because there's, there's sort of the joke in the amateur rocketry community that, you know, uh, you really can't put uh, guidance on it because once you put guidance on a rocket, it becomes a missile. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes. the United States government isn't a big fan of people who aren't the United States government getting missiles. So. Yeah. I, honestly, Honestly, I don't know why, because it's like <laughs> you deal with like legalities, but I love talking about this. Um, so there are basically there are like three regulations that you want to pay attention to in rocketry. Um, the first one is FAA Part 101, which deals with model rockets and that different there are different classifications of vehicles, and none of it mentions active guidance or active control. Hmm. The second one is uh, the National Association of Model Rocketry as a safety code. Again, there's no mention of active guidance or control. And the third one is another organization, uh, Tripoli, and they don't mention active guidance or control anyway. So there aren't actually, <laughs> I have to be careful about this. There aren't actually, <laughs> like, like the part that you get, because you can get in trouble for this stuff, but the way that you get in trouble is by, um, usually by exporting it or mm. um, sharing enough of your information. And so actually you mm. see a lot of university teams um, with really high powered vehicles steering away from this stuff. And uh, usually for good reason, um, because export controls regulations, this is like ITAR or the USML. Um, these things deal with the sharing of information as well as the sharing of hardware or software. Oh, so, sorry. what's USML? Uh, USML is basically the same as ITAR. That's the United States Munitions List. Okay. Um, if you want to read it, it's it's like I don't know, several hundred pages of just really confusing words. But yay, lawyer speak. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. So it is. Uh, it's generally, uh, and then the other thing is there is some gray area in this too, um, but if, I think generally if you're doing it with good intent and if you're not strapping any type of, oh, oh, I didn't differentiate guidance, by the way. Mm. So my yeah. rockets have stability and not guidance, and the difference between the two is stability just tries to keep the rocket upright. It's doing the exact same job as a, fins on, as a set of fins on model rockets would, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you're just trying to make sure it stays straight up in the air. Right. And guidance would be maneuvering um, in reference to some point in the real world. So, like, you're trying to, I mean, <laughs> you shouldn't do this, but, like, you're trying to hit a point <laughs> or you're trying to land on a point, you know, like if you're landing a model rocket. But mine just have stability, so they try to maintain upright, uh, maintain stability. Oh, okay. Yeah. Got so it. So okay. stability is a lot more safe um, legality-wise than right. guidances, and I think things get a little bit more tricky there. Yeah, because then it's on the lines of possibly being more like a missile if it actually has right. guidance. Right. That's when it can direct, like you were saying. Yeah. Anyways, I think there may be like, I think there's some there's some amount of um, scale that gets into this too. If you build something that's guided that weighs, um, I don't know, like a, a half a kilogram, it's probably mm -hmm. not going to be an issue. If you're building at like something that's like 20 kilograms, you're going to probably get some calls about that. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, yeah, just a little bit. So, yeah, because um, yeah, twenty kilograms moving really fast is quite energetic. So. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's it's tough though. There's there there is some gray area in it. I just mm -hmm. I generally speaking though, there's actually a lot of information about this on the BPS.space website under the about section. I have lots of there's resources for like the legality around this stuff. Um, 
But yeah, you generally want to stick to stability instead of guidance. Gotcha. Wow. So what were those first, like, what, was you, what were you doing at first with your rockets to, to, to develop the stability with them? Um, like the first test flights? Yeah, what was that like? <laughs> like, cause so you're, bad. I mean, you're putting, <laughs> you're, I saw a couple of videos yeah. actually. Yeah. You're putting all of this together <laughs> awesome. and you're all self-taught about that. So what, like, what's happening during this early time frame with your flights? Yeah, um, so the schedule, the schedule for most of this stuff is like, you wake up, you go to Starbucks for three hours, read Rocket Propulsion mm -hmm. Elements by George Sutton. <laughs> uh, this is like, this is like the, the Bible of aerospace engineering. But, um, yeah, so, it's just a lot of that, then you go home and I, I basically built like a rigid schedule of like making sure I was focusing on the uh, on all of the different aspects of this. So you have like mechanical engineering, you have um, electronic or electrical engineering, that's like your wiring, you have um, uh, software design, things like that. But these first test flights, the first test flights were like awful. Um, the <laughs> first one... The first one was like a really obvious error that if you if you showed it to anyone without any further results, they'd be like, "Yeah, you're never gonna make this work." Hmm. Like if you if you did if you made an error like that, silly, it, it just won't work at all. Um, and actually, that was like the first ten flights or so were pretty bad. There was like one that l was really lucky to have looked really good on camera, um, but it was for real just because of like the angle. <laughs> um, of the camera. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they were all bad, and so you learn a little bit more every time. You, you look at the flight data, you look at, um, actually, one of the benefits here, so um, I mentioned off-air, but on-air, basically, I was a videographer um, as I was mm -hmm. learning these things. So, especially with shooting weddings, you work a lot on the weekend, um, and then during the week, you just spend a lot of time at Starbucks reading books. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, um, because I was a videographer, I had access to all of these nice cameras. There was like, uh, the company I worked for had a RED camera and mm -hmm. we were able to shoot a lot of high speed footage to, so that I could quickly diagnose after a test flight, what was actually going on on the vehicle in addition to the flight data. Um, so this is again, this is like 3D printing. It's the iterative design. Um, if you can afford to <laughs> just go through a little bit of frustration, it's a really fast way to like get things moving. Yeah, and do, was there a certain like, kind of regime with your flight testing that you were working within? It um, changed a few times. Um, the first few, okay, yeah, yeah, it changed a few times because the first series of vehicles were called um, the Scout Rocket. They were actually dogs themed. Um, the Scout <laughs> Rocket, it's like Scout's kind of a dog name. The yeah. computer's name was uh, Fetch. The launch, pad, <laughs> the launch pad software was Throw. Uh, Throw. <laughs> so so when, when you first started, like your first launch attempts, was it all stuff you made, or did yeah. you go to? Wow, you yeah. just started from scratch. Because yeah. I mean, you're now pro your company now provides yeah. what other people can buy, but you didn't have access to you. Yeah, no, I did not have <laughs> access to future future Joe. I wish I did. <laughs> it would have been a lot easier. Um, yeah. But yeah, so wow. you, went, you go through a lot of like a lot of garbage designs, um, a lot of silly errors. Um, you end up with mm -hmm. a lot of those too. <laughs> like yeah. I, you, know, you neglect so. to check a wire that's stuck in some mechanical connection Always. or like mm -hmm. you, um, you do some testing on some code and you have a bunch of it commented out and then you show up at the launch pad and you haven't re-uploaded the new version or whatever. So, um, yeah, the first, you asked about the, like the flight objectives or like the, um, what are your like, like parameters yeah. that you're working with? So um, the first few flights were of the scout vehicle, like I mentioned, and the goal was just to launch and land in the same flight all up, like with no experience doing it, which as you can imagine, doesn't really work so well. And you end up smashing a lot of rockets that you've put a lot of work into. So um, after about a year of that, um, I had <laughs> spent enough money and enough time where I was like, this is not working. We need to s switch to something different. So I built a new rocket called Echo. Um, and a lot of these are just aesthetic changes. They use a lot of the same flight computers and components. But the new rocket was, um, like, the airframe was much more stable. I basically built it so that if it hit the ground, like, really hard, if it didn't deploy any parachutes and just free falled right into the ground, it would still be OK to fly in, like, a day or two. Um, and that helped a lot. That helped, like, really speed up the um, time between launches. So Echo was like a new, not like mission objective, but like 
test profile, I guess. So uh, reusability mm. is key. Reusability yeah. is key. <laughs> <laughs> it yeah. is. I, I love how much experimentation was done and that you do mention that a lot. And I think actually on your website, there, there's a line that's my favorite. It talks about how experimentation is really the way to you know, start to achieve these things. So I have a really awesome question from the chat, um, from Jaken from YouTube. And they ask uh, about actually their, the fact that you have kits. They say, yeah. um, are we going to ever do model rocket competitions in school? <laughs> and what do you think? What type should we build, water rocket or solid fuel? And I think that's super important mm -hmm. that you know, your kits bring experimentations to, to people. So what yeah. are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I think, I think model rocket competitions are awesome. Um, I actually, I, I've had it in my mind to like start one um, a couple of times, but it's a, it's like a non-trivial amount of work. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, but the, the, I think the other thing I mentioned on the website, whether I mention it or not, this is just how I feel about it. But like experimentation is the way that I learn best. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think everyone does, but just being able to have hands-on tools like a regular model rocket, a water rocket, doesn't even matter. Um, something that can, something that you can like actually play with or work with to help you gain an understanding of a new concept or of a new thing that you're learning is just crazy helpful. Um, at least for me, I found that the only way I'm able to really learn something, un like until I actually interact with it in the physical world, mm -hmm. I, I, I haven't really understood what's going on. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So I think, yeah. I think competitions like that um, or just any incentive to get kids to like play with model rockets or play with any engineering thing. Like I did um, first robotics in high school, this mm -hmm. you know, massive robotics competition. And it, for myself and for all of my friends who were involved, it was just a huge, it's like so important to fostering that um, like innate desire that a lot of us have to build things or to experiment. Yeah. yeah. Well, speaking actually of experiments, really another <laughs> good question from the chat. I, I love this one, it's from, um, uh, WKD from YouTube says, with the amount of launch experiments you do, which bums you out more, bad launch or not getting the shot? Mm. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You know, <laughs> I think at this point, it's a bad launch that disappoints me more, but that was only like a really recent flip because <laughs> At this point, there's just a ton of media that I can pull from to be like, look how well things work, um, even if they don't, <laughs> like, you know, some of the time. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, because because I have a videography background, like, I also really want to get the shot. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yep. yeah, so, like, sometimes I'll, I'll do a launch and, like, my shutter speed on my camera will be too low and they're all blurry. Like, they're all blurry um, or something mm -hmm. like that. But at this point, I think the engineering is more what, what disappoints me than the actual... You know, as long as I get the flight data back, it's fine. <laughs> Got so, it. So what began to happen when you started having, like, success with your rockets actually coming back? It like, felt really good. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a solid year of failure. Um, just, like, one after the other where each time it was more frustrating. And then at some point, the rocket went up. And it didn't, like, fishtail everywhere. And it didn't, you know, flop about. It did actually fail to deploy the parachutes and slam into the ground. But <laughs> the up part worked. Um, yeah. And yeah, it just, it's kind of how you, it's kind of like how we watch SpaceX go from not being able to land anything to as soon as they could land it once and like get all of that data back on what a successful flight looked like, they st it just got a lot faster. It like, it just really ramped up the pace. And it's the same thing here is as soon as I knew what worked, um, it was able to, I, I was able to really like focus on the things that were working and what what still that wasn't working. Um, so everything just accelerated at that point. Yeah, so verification was really like critical for, yeah. for moving this forward. Yeah, for sure. Um, and even, you know, it doesn't mean that at that point things were perfect. Like every single part of the rocket has fundamentally changed since that point. Um, we went through a, a like a a period of like not launching anything over the summer of 2017 where I was just revamping all of the math behind like the flight software and flight simulation um, and things like that and that really improved reliability too. But you know as soon as you get if you can get like that one success if you can make it to that point usually you can make it a little further. Yeah. 
So speaking actually of moving forward, there's so many good questions in this yeah. chat. Um, that someone asked specifically about that. They're uh, called Apple Jesus. Uh, <laughs> <in the chat. laughs> Pretty good. Oh, such a good, such Remind a good name. Me to yell that out. Apple when Jesus. We, when we reach the high point. Yeah. Yeah. Apple yeah. Jesus. <laughs> um, so they ask, uh, how do you see your development pathway going forward? Better reusability, switch from solids to pressure-fed liquids, um, advanced multi-stage. Yeah. There's so yeah. many there's so many cool things that like yeah. in directions that this could go. So I think um, we've got like mm, like three major things going on right now. The first mm -hmm. is this series of videos that I'm producing. Um, it's sort of educational and it's like if you were going to start from nothing, if you were going to start from where I was in 2015, like w here's exactly how you'd go about landing a model rocket. Now I haven't done it yet, so I'm, you know, like, you don't have to follow the series and believe what I say. But <laughs> I feel like I'm pretty close. And that leads to the second one. That's, so the first major one is producing that video series. The second oh. one is actually landing the rocket. Yeah. Um, we've come really close. It's like two <laughs> meters off the ground, and it hovers, and it, it just, it's so close. Um, I'm in the middle of, like, um, a massive software update for the landing stuff. That's, we're, it's like, it, we're going to stick it in 2019 for sure. But um, heard it here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You heard it here on tomorrow, twelve dot zero five. Yeah. Yeah. On February second. You heard it here. I'll wow. stand by it. So um, that, and then the third one is the uh, Falcon Heavy model. I built a one forty eighth scale model that was of the so SpaceX impressive. Falcon Heavy. Uh, and <laughs> yes, that, that was yeah. awesome. It's like uh, the staging. So, look at it. What? It's so. Look it's, at how beautiful it is. It's so oh. true. Exactly what what Elon said about it, which is that on the surface, it's like cool. You strap three rockets together, mm -hmm. except. It's like a billion times harder. There's so many. There's so many weird considerations that happen when you put three of these things together. Anyway, those are like the three major projects that are, like, I'm working on now. And at some point, uh, the landing is gonna sort of wrap up because we'll have done it. I mean, that's yeah. hopefully. <laughs> I suppose it couldn't happen, but yeah. Um, yeah, there's some bigger projects that are coming up in like later 2019. Um, I don't know how much I want to say about it. Okay, but it's, that's it's, fair. Yeah. The rockets are going to get <laughs> yep. larger. Ooh, that's awesome. so exciting. <laughs> yeah. um, really good question from Minnie Stoge, okay. uh, actually. Hi, Stoge. <laughs> and uh, she asks, <laughs> are you going to start building your models out of carbon fiber, like Electron? <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, speaking uh, of future <laughs> stuff. Yeah. That's, it's such a cool looking vehicle. Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so actually, we're at a small enough scale, at least with these rockets. Most of them are about a meter tall, right? Mm -hmm. They're not. They're not that large. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's actually, you know, as long as you're not hitting the ground that fast, um, it's better to just build them out of cardboard. That's the the lightest mm -hmm. material. Right. But like some of those larger projects, actually, I can talk about one of the larger projects. Ooh, okay. We're uh, I'm building a reaction control system um, for a couple of high power rockets. I'm working with um, a buddy of mine up in Boston with it, um, but. Yeah, that's going to need to be built out of a better material than cardboard uh, mm. because that's going to be going pretty high and really fast. Gotcha. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you're going high enough yeah. to need a reaction RCS. control yeah. system. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Holy moly. Yeah. I kind of want to ask you about the challenge of using solid motors because I think you're just using only solid motors um, yeah. at this time. Right. And that, you know, you light it and it's lit and it's burning until it runs out of fuel. And there's yeah. no change in it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You, you yeah. did so. have a, a mention of you can throttle back a little bit if you do certain things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll, <laughs> first we'll address like the solid motor thing. Basically, it's a little bit cheating, honestly. If you know your flight profile well enough, like ahead, if you know that you're gonna, I don't know, have an apogee between 50 and 60 meters or something, just as an example, you can get really close if you spec the motor that you use so to only landing. Lasts. Even if even if you don't even if you don't get it quite right, like the legs should be able to take a little bit of the impact mm -hmm. um, if it drops, um, and then if it hops a little bit, hopefully you can just maintain stability long enough that it comes back down to the ground. So it is cheating a little bit because I know exactly how high the rocket is going to go. Um, and Is that cheating or is that just really good science? It's just, <laughs> it's just a lot of simple, it's, a, it's simplifying a lot of the problems that are with landing. But I think yeah. that's kind of the key of engineering, right? Yeah. Like know what you need to do and get it right. Yeah, whatever so, accomplishes the task. Yeah. If it works and it's stupid, then it's not stupid. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you're not. <laughs> But okay, so then the second part is you mentioned the throttling um, the solid motors. That can actually be done. There are some mm -hmm. there are some interesting ways that you can do that. You could do one, <clears throat> you could do like a system where 
you, uh, this is, this is, I kind of, I refer to it as like cosine throttling because you get <laughs> mm -hmm. cosine losses in your motor. So you have like two of them pointed outward and then you sort of gimbal them outward as you want less and less thrust. Mm -hmm. um, that's one way to do it. You could um, stick something in the exhaust plume that, that like, you know, takes away some of the thrust. You could, um, there may actually be an instance of this later this year, but you could perhaps change the size of your chamber. Um, that sounds like the hardest possible thing to do, but we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Because I know a shuttle, <laughs> with yeah. the shuttle solid rocket boosters, they would cha basically change the surface area that would be burning inside mm -hmm. of it. Right. Um, but and it's that real... would allow the SRVs to actually be able to be throttleable um, if you wanted to with that. So. Yeah. And the reason, you know, the one of the direct things, if you know what like a hybrid motor is, a hybrid motor is sort of a bridge between a liquid and a solid motor. And they're scary. Mm -hmm. They're scary. <laughs> yeah. And they're hard to simulate. And they've got all these problems. But um, they're like, you could certainly do this with a small liquid motor or a hybrid motor um, but you know there are also there's like a certain amount of challenges that I'm willing to accept and a certain amount where I'm like I'm just not gonna touch that for a little while so hybrids and liquids like you're just not interested at well, the moment in not that? right now okay yeah gotcha. yeah so which, there's there's bigger projects coming but not right now <laughs> gotcha. yeah. which path are you leaning toward are you the gimbling out or are you thinking maybe compressing the I still think it can just work with one the motors that I'm using, um, like in model rocket motors, you generally expect like a 5% total impulse variance. Um, so like how much, how much total energy is your motor going to give the rocket? Um, and there's, there's usually about a 5% variation. But I've done a bunch of testing um, on the specific motors I'm using. And it's like I found it to be within like 1% or 2%. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's enough that if I can get an accurate enough start on the rec retro burn, um, I think I can reliably touch down. Again, like, we'll see. <laughs> Who knows? But, <laughs> and if it doesn't work, I think the right way to do it, um, I outlined this in one of my videos, but I think the, the right way to do it might be to, well, the one that I would choose is you have a small set of tiny solid motors on the outside, and then you sort of underspec the main landing motor mm -hmm. so that you can sort of do, it's almost like, you know how the Soyuz lands or the Blue Origin New mm -hmm. Shepard mm -hmm. captain last second yeah. yep. pushes it down? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you do like these little impulse motors on the side that just add or subtract. Well, not subtract, yeah. but like <laughs> add a little bit of energy. Yeah. Right. We'll see. Oh. I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have got a question for you. As, actually, as you're speaking, I'm thinking a lot about, okay, what can be like this use for eventually? Because it's, yeah. it's awesome. You know, it's really yeah. fun. Yeah. But, and then you made these kits, and I'm like, what else could it be used for? Well, there's this awesome question from the chat that addresses this. Uh, it's from AL13N, and they actually ask, if you propulsively land, can you actually put payload on it? So is that a thing you thought of maybe doing, is yeah. like doing some type of payload and eventually turning this into something you can, yeah, collaborate with other co like companies on? Yeah, you could certainly do that. Um, I think that's probably not the path that I'd take with it. Okay. Um, I think if you, like the height that most of my rockets end up going to, it's just going to be more cost effective to send it up on a drone. Um, mm, you know, okay. some, sometimes you get, I mean, not that there are ever, ever people who leave mean comments on YouTube, but sometimes. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but sometimes the comments are like, why, you know, why would you spend so much time on this? Like, there's no real use for it. And I actually, mm -hmm. I have to agree. Like, it's not that there's no real use, but like, the plan isn't to go super commercial and have a bunch of you know, big customers or whatever. It's just like, this is a cool project. I like doing this stuff and I like teaching people along the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. I think, you know, maybe there are some commercial applications for it, but mostly I'm, I'm focused on the engineering and like how cool that is. To and me. the educational aspect yeah. too is huge. Yeah. I mean, the, the fact that I was um, watching one of the videos on your website and you know, you're saying as soon as the kits hit the market, and you weren't even going to do kits at first. There's mm -hmm. people recommending yeah. it. Yeah. And as soon as it hit the market, it like sold out right yeah. away. And, yeah. and that's just, that's extraordinary because it's starting to then inspire the future generations mm -hmm. to want to go into this. And it, it also is worth mentioning, like, you'll never beat, like, the simplicity in model rockets of fins. The yeah. point, mm -hmm. yeah, the point isn't that it's yeah. useful, really. It's that it's cool. Yes. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> yeah. Which, is, which is a perfectly which is a totally totally good reason yeah. to do it. Is. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, I've seen people turn things that shouldn't be rockets into rockets because it looks cool. Yeah, so, why not? So, I yeah. mean, well, who doesn't want to see a traffic cone suddenly flying? Yeah, traffic yeah. cone so, suddenly yeah. Yeah. <laughs> A tiki bar, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. things. So. I mean, and yeah. speaking of cool things, like, I do want to actually talk a little bit about your music. 
And then yeah. also, I, I realized, I was like, that's something I definitely wanted to bring up. And there is also a comment from the chat. Um, also, awesome chat room. It comes from WKD. And um, they, off of YouTube. And they asked, what's the deal with wedding photographers and space enthusiasm? So it, <laughs> Who knows, man? Uh -huh. Like, what is that? I, mean, it's, I guess it's a thing. I don't know. Maybe a lot of other people out there are wedding photographers and love space travel. But but where, how did this, this happen for you? I, I know, mean, yeah, like I know three off the bat. Like Brady Keniston is a wedding photographer. Really? Tim yeah. Dodd was a wedding photographer. Yes, Tim was. Dodd was a wedding photographer. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, what, yes. What's the deal? What's going on? I believe he's watching, too, if you want to say hi. Hello. What up, Tim? <laughs> Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know what that is. I like have no answer. I will say that like I really didn't enjoy being a wedding videographer. A lot Does of people anyone? Do. Uh, fuck. I mean, <laughs> I'm yeah. not gonna speak for everyone. The same I, music. I didn't, right? I didn't enjoy it, and like more than any other job I've ever had, like I didn't enjoy that so much that you, when you do a job that you don't like, your mind goes immediately to what you want to be doing. Yeah. yeah. And so it was as soon as I started doing wedding videography, and I saw the SpaceX stuff, I was like, cool. Like there's a there's like a countdown on me doing this job. Yeah. That's okay. so epic. Yeah. So, <laughs> do you do anything with music still? I um, mean... Yeah, so I studied at the Berkeley College of Music. I okay. have this really nice education in music. <laughs> and I kind of use it. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, mathematics, music well, yeah. theory. I mean, yeah, to be fair, there's like, I did a lot of acoustics stuff at Berkeley too, and there's like a lot of cool um, math and like determining the mode of a room or things like mm -hmm. that. But um, I do music. Um, kind of like Tim Dodd, I, I make all the music for the videos that I put out. Mm -hmm. It's not a ton of stuff, but um, yeah, it's fun. Music it's so is great. Cool. Yeah, <laughs> it I kind of want to ask you too, as someone like myself who started like in an art background and is now going into engineering and things like that. Yeah. Um, what was kind of the? Have you gotten a reaction from the aerospace community on this? And mm -hmm. kind of like, how's that been? Because I know that when I went into the aerospace community. Um, it was kind of like feeling like an outsider coming in initially. Yeah. Like I was someone with a different perspective than everybody else coming in and kind of like, I don't want to say being shunned, but not necessarily. It doesn't feel good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it doesn't yeah. really feel yeah. that great to be around initially. Mm -hmm. well, so dismissal. So yeah, a little bit of dismissal. Yeah. As, a, as I think as, that's normal. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I felt that for a while. Um, I still, like there are still situations. We did, I did a... Um, I, I presented some of my work at uh, the Marshall Space Flight Center in wow. mm -hmm. uh, Huntsville, Alabama. And I remember, so, I mean, they're all brilliant, like, mm -hmm. in ways that, like, I just will never understand. They're all just brilliant down there. And so I presented my work, and, like, naturally, as engineers, they want to know the details. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a real limit to, like, my knowledge on this stuff. Right. Because a lot of it is learned by experimentation, mm -hmm. which means I have these weird holes in, like, my... Mm -hmm like what I know. So they would ask a question that to them seems really simple and I'd be like, honestly, I don't know. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So there's still, there's still stuff like that. Um, I think, I don't know, I think everyone feels like an outsider at some point. Do you have any plans to maybe get, you know, part-time work on an engineering degree, maybe having the math and the, the actual uh, materials knowledge that they're asking about would that give you kind of a an edge on give yeah, you a little boost think, for what you're doing? I mean, that would certainly be like the responsible thing to do, and I think it I think it honestly is a good a good thing to do. I don't have any like hard plans for it right now, no. but I think especially if if the ambition is to work in an actual aerospace job, which right now it's just to further BPS. But if that's yeah. if my goal switches back to like I want to work for an aerospace engineering company. I think the responsible thing to do is like to go back and get your degree. Um, mm -hmm. There's a, there's like, I think I, um, there was a little mini doc that uh, Motherboard did um, just recently, but I mentioned it in this and I'll mention it again. There are some things that work for self-teaching, like for software engineering where you can mess things up a bunch of times right. and just re-upload your code. Mm -hmm. That's fine, I think. Um, but like, if you're a surgeon, Maybe you yeah. don't want to do yeah. the self-taught <laughs> iterative yeah. like, yes. Maybe not. Yeah. And I think aerospace is somewhere in between there, especially if you're working at the larger scale. The stakes are really high, mm -hmm. um, and you you kind of want to really have that good base of knowledge. Yeah. So for the model rocket scale, it's fine, um, but at mm -hmm. some point, you know, you probably want to get the degree. And when you do these test flights, you kind of have like an audience with you there watching them? Like, <laughs> Actually, do, you, do you do them at like little events that they have on the weekends or? I'm not, so so, cool. I'm not superstitious, except for this one except thing. For. <laughs> because, 
Except as it, it goes. Yep. So. <laughs> Every single time. Every single time. <laughs> Every single time I have brought people to a launch and been like, hey, you want to come see my like what I do for my job? Yeah. Um, <laughs> It goes terribly wrong. Um, <laughs> oh it's no. like oh horrible. God. One time, oh no. um, one time, I brought my parents and my grandfather and like my friends out to this test site, and it was sunset and it was gorgeous. And the rocket goes up, super straight, and then it comes down, and it's time to deploy the parachutes, and it deploys them, and the parachutes work, except that they're not connected to the rocket. <laughs> <laughs> oops, oops, yeah, oops indeed. Oh uh, man. Oops indeed, and a completely smashed rocket. Uh, one time, oh. uh, actually just recently, so my friend Nanny is for this little kid. Uh, he's like six or seven years old, and he loves space, you know, because he's a little kid. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I was like, hey, come see a rocket launch. Um, and <laughs> that whole week, I tried every single day to launch the rocket, and every time something would fail with the motor ignition or something. I made a whole video about it. I about, was watching that. Yeah, before, failure yeah. and burnout. Mm -hmm. So great. Um, and it's just like I don't know what it is. I wish it wouldn't be the case, but honestly, like half the reason I generally just have myself and no one else at the launch site is because it's not a safety thing. It's just like things seem to just go wrong when other people are there. <laughs> Performance anxiety. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. what it is. Poor uh, rockets. So uh, uh, <laughs> no possibility for a live stream is a question we have from the chat from PCS Locked. What if Joe live streams next BPS space launch and Tim covers it <laughs> just as a real live stream launch. is a different thing. I would be down to have someone else live stream it. Um, okay. Because right. I, it's the live stream is mostly just I'm focused all on getting the rocket set up and then getting my camera set up. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. I don't know, maybe like, all of these other little tiny things that have to happen at the launch site, and a lot of my energy can't be focused on, like what's the chat go what's the chat doing right now? Right, um, right. Yeah. So if someone else, you know, came down and live streamed, that would be cool. But yeah, uh, I'm probably not going to do it just myself. Yeah. So you're willing right. to show it live mm -hmm. and not talk about it like Very three cool. days later, like Blue Origin yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> three days gotcha. later. So. There's a lot of secretive stuff that they do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then it won't be superstitious anymore. So yeah, there we go. You'll break the superstition in my in my mind. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and we actually have a question from Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut. Yeah. Hey. 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 <laughs> um, so he asks, um, how you land with how do you land with the solids? One motor, two motors. How does the computer calculate when you ignite the next engine? Cool. Yeah. So hi Tim, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> um, but. Uh, yeah, the way that I do it, it's it's sort of like brute force through a lot of simulation. Actually, you hear Elon Musk talk about this sometimes, called a Monte Carlo simulation stuff. Mm -hmm. So for yeah. calculating when you want to land the rocket motor, I have a flight simulator offline um, that I just I run a ton of simulations and find like, cool with this given profile, with the vehicle mass, with um, these two. It's two motors. You have one motor for ascent, mm -hmm. and then it burns out. And um, they're actually, I think I. I just I talk about it a little bit in the Falcon Heavy video, but they're actually mm -hmm. stacked on top of each other, and the second motor literally hot stages the first motor out. Um, nice. When it's wow. time to land. It's like but, an, an old school Atlas. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a um, yeah. So it's it's sort of brute force, force through a lot of simulation. Um, you determine what, where is like the range of altitudes that I should be burning that retro motor, um, and then it's pretty simple in the flight software. Um, it's nothing like. The real Falcon 9 uses um, this super complex thing called G-Fold, but um, my rockets mostly just look at the apogee. They look at a couple other things, like the orientation, if it's going to be safe to burn the motor, things like that, and then they just sort of call it when they see it. Um, <laughs> nice. <Yeah. laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah. Very nice. cool. <laughs> that is super cool. So overall, yeah. what has sort of like been the biggest takeaway from all of this for you? Like, What's the thing that's affected you the most? that you would kind of want to throw out there for, for everyone to take. Mm -hmm. I think this might seem obvious at this point. So BPS has a, has a decent size following at this point. But um, share your work online. Like, yeah. even, if it's, even if it's not good, especially like you can see if you go all the way back to like the beginning videos on the BPS YouTube channel, or like, I don't know, it's really hard to go all the way back on Twitter, but whatever. <laughs> um, <Yes. laughs> all the way back. like. Even if it, even if stuff isn't working, you should still share what you're working on online. Um, you don't have to share all of it. You don't have to like open source it. But if you share it, you'll become a better engineer because of it. Um, I definitely have. Like every time something has failed, 
sometimes it's frustrating when someone's like, well, why don't you just do this? But um, <laughs> a lot of the times, yep. people just want to help and they just want, and you know, they have different perspectives that will help you. So I guess the takeaway for me is like, make sure, like if you're doing something cool, tell other people about it. Um, don't, there's a lot of excuses you can make to not share your work online. And I think most of them aren't, aren't really valid. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Well. And tell us a little bit about BPS space. Um, what would you like to know? It's mostly, I, I don't really understand it still. <laughs> <laughs> so is it like a resource for people to go to? I yeah. mean, they could, buy, they could buy kits as well from you? This is hard, it's hard to describe because I still don't really know like what to focus on um, mm -hmm. or rather like what to focus on when I'm talking about it, but it's a couple of different things. I think I'd like to make it more of a resource, which is why I'm doing this like landing model rockets video series. Um, so right now we're in the middle of designing a new computer with all of the you know specific things that we want to land the model rocket, and then after that, like I'm just going to bring everyone along as we design all the mechanical parts and things like that. Um, but yeah, so it's a little bit of a resource. We're also a, a direct to consumer. We, like we sell um, these flight computers um, for thrust vector control and model rockets. Um, they are out of stock right now. I'm working really hard to fix manufacturing stuff. But um, <laughs> but yeah, we sell those. Um, and then a lot of the, you know, some of the bigger things are uh, we release a lot of the files um, that come out with the landing model rocket series on Patreon. So we're, we're um, a lot of the reason that this stuff still exists is through Patreon, which is crazy. It's amazing, like, the generosity of some people. Yeah. 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 And if people would like to get more information about you, Joe, where can they go to? Literally bps.space. You don't need the www either. Uh, <laughs> Got rid of that. Yeah. So. yeah. bps.space. That's the website. All right. Well, yeah. Joe, thank you so yeah. much for coming on the show today. Yeah, thanks uh, for having you're me. You're doing some amazing work in an area that has really like not seen much advancement for a very long period yeah. of time. Model rocketry has been pretty static in terms of uh, what it can do. Recently with like Arduino and everything, mm -hmm. it's kind of come to a point where you can like do some really cool things, but you're like expert you're making it exponentially cooler <laughs> yes. um, with being able to land it. And I'm really looking forward to the big things um, because I would like to land my big things yes. um, with that. <laughs> Mostly because I always have problems packing my parachutes. So, uh, so Joe, thank you so much <laughs> yeah, uh, for coming you. on the show today. And of course, we want to thank you, our viewers, and our patrons as well. Our Escape Velocity citizens. These folks give us $10 or more per episode uh, to help us out here at Tomorrow. Also, so our orbital citizens who give us five dollars or more per episode as well and then of course we have our suborbital citizens you give us 250 or more per episode and we'll give you a little bit of time to find your name here and of course we also have our ground support citizens <laughs> as well you can uh, attempt to find your name there as best you can uh, very itty bitty font and I love the fact that that font has has to get smaller and smaller, smaller and smaller, smaller as, as things yeah. are going on um, and uh, you when you support us here at tomorrow you're able to uh, provide things like these amazing interviews like we got to do with Joe today um, to talk about BPS space um, also our new show which is brand new um, which everyone seems to like and yep. we're gonna definitely keep uh, doing that as well and maybe some things in the future Yes. Um, as well with that. And of course, we do give you rewards back. You know, you can check us out on Discord at our Discord channel. Um, you can also come on over to community.tmro.tv as well um, because you, it's not just financial support that we welcome. If you have any sort of skills that you would like to help us out with, uh, you are more than welcome to bring them to the show um, and we will utilize them and uh, we'll put you to work uh, if you want to get put to work. Uh, so, <laughs> on next week's show, 12 Dot zero six. We are going to have Asgardia uh, come on in to talk about the uh, the at attempt, or I guess they sort of are uh, yeah. a, a, a yeah. space they nation. Are, yeah. uh, I know a couple citizens currently. Yeah, <laughs> yes. I know. I know. I think me and Space Mike actually signed up yeah. uh, to be a part of that. So, yeah. um, oh, and Ben too. So oh. uh, I don't think we've paid our citizenship fees. Oh, you've paid yours. Okay, I haven't paid well, mine. Oh. So uh, I guess that I've, makes him mayor or something. I will have to. <laughs> yeah, are you like the overlord of Asgardia? Or the no, the, he said the, you're the lackey. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 All right, so thank you so much for watching Tomorrow Orbit 12.05, and we will see you next time. Bye.